We begin in Massachusetts, where the descendant of two enslaved people who were captured in mid-19th century photographs has sued Harvard University, accusing the university of unfairly profiting from their images. Tamara Lanier of Connecticut argues in a lawsuit filed this month that she and other descendants of Renty and Delia, two people held in bondage 169 years ago, should hold the rights to their photographs, not Harvard. Renty and Delia were forced to pose for the photographs in 1850 by a well-known Harvard professor. The theory was used to justify the ongoing enslavement of black people prior to the Civil War, as well as segregation. The images of Renty and Delia were used in a recent Harvard conference titled Universities and Slavery Bound by History. This comes after administrators at Harvard and other elite universities have admitted they were founded largely through the labor of enslaved African people and profits generated by the slave trade. We are taking you on a ride, thought-provoking and melancholic, poignant, even nostalgic, acquainting your minds with new places of old histories, so that they start to feel somewhat familiar, even though you've never been there before. Where hard stories are told by the mere viewings of the pictures that come, penetrating helplessly one's sense of belonging. You can't help feeling hurt. The thought-provoking old photos of black slaves presented in this video offer a striking glimpse into the lives of individuals subjected to one of the darkest chapters in human history. It is, indeed, a great honor to have such stimulating photos amongst us in this current age. They are, no doubt, strong footprints and lodestars locating hidden truths of ancient events and the struggles of the black communities in those dark days. These images, though heartbreaking most of the time, do really serve as a stark reminder of the enduring spirit of resilience, hope, and love that prevailed, even amidst unimaginable suffering. Welcome to yet another interesting video segment. This time around, we dare to relate the pure state of enslaved Africans and the surrounding eventualities of their historic sufferings through pictures. Prepare to embark on a journey through time as we delve into the captivating narratives behind some powerful images of the unforgettable past. However, before we continue, don't forget to support our efforts by hitting the regular like button Share with families and friends to keep spreading our eye-opening black narrative. And subscribe to keep the channel growing. We appreciate your support immensely. Manacled for three years, 1907. The historical photo you see right before you depicts a British sailor in the year 1907 removing a slave shackle from the leg of a newly freed African slave. This thought-provoking image is a stark and powerful reminder of the horrors of slavery and the enduring legacy of the suffering of the colored race. The picture is part of a small collection donated by Samuel Chidwick to the Royal Naval Museum in Portsmouth, whose father able seaman Joseph Chidwick had taken it when serving aboard HMS Sphinx on armed patrol off the Zanzibar and Mozambique coast in 1907. The Africans featured in the photos escaped in a canoe from a slave trading village on the coast on hearing that the Royal Navy ship was in the area. In his report dated 15th of October 1907, Commander Litchfield wrote that the ship received six fugitives on a cruise off the Botany Coast, Oman, between 10th and 14th October. One of the fugitives had been manacled for three years and had escaped with his leg iron still on. The sad-looking African in the photo was that escapee, sitting on the ground, his face etched with the lines of hardship and resilience, bears the silent witness to the untellable horrors of his cruel enslavement. His legs are bare, revealing the deep scars left by the shackles. The British sailor, kneeling before him, carefully cuts through the metal with a hacksaw. The contrast between the two figures is striking. The sailor's symbol of freedom and the man's shackles of bondage. The shackle itself is a heavy iron contraption, designed to inflict pain and restrict movement. It is a physical manifestation of the dehumanization of slavery, a symbol of the way in which enslaved people were treated as property rather than human beings. The photo is a reminder of the millions of people who were enslaved throughout history and the countless lives that were destroyed by this cruel institution. It is a call to action, urging us to fight against all forms of injustice and oppression. The slave shackle is a symbol of the past, but it is also a reminder of the present. Slavery still exists in the world today, in many different forms. We must continue to fight for freedom and justice and never forget the horrors of the past.
Oldest Slave Photos in America The strong-willed face you see in this photo is that of the remarkable African by name, Renty Taylor. Also known as Renty Thompson or Papa Renty, he was a man of the 18th and 19th centuries who endured the gruesome horrors of slavery in the United States. Despite the brutality of his circumstances, this remarkable personality would not break. Despite being subjected to a series of photographs intended to objectify and dehumanize him, Renty Taylor's unwavering dignity and resilience shone through in his portraits. His gaze and overall demeanor conveyed a sense of strength and self-possession that defied the photographer's intentions. Renty Taylor's posture is also noteworthy. He stands tall and proud, refusing to bow under the weight of oppression. His eyes, though solemn and bearing the weight of his experiences, convey a sense of inner strength and resilience. He refused to be objectified or dehumanized, even in the face of Agassiz's attempts to use his image to support racist theories. And it's no surprise if you are already asking, what is this about? Now let's delve even deeper on the affairs of photos, broaching briefly on the story of Renty Taylor for a second. Once upon a time in 1850, during the lingering dark ages of enslavement, photography was a fairly new technology back then, as a group of white men 1,000 miles away from Cambridge, Massachusetts, conspired with a famous Harvard professor to use it. Louis Agassiz, a pioneer of natural science and proponent of scientific racism, had traveled to South Carolina hoping to prove the inferiority of the black race in his theory called polygenesis, to aid his effort, the men had selected seven black people, most from nearby plantations, and hauled them to a posh photo studio in downtown Columbia, where they stripped old Renty, his daughter Delia, and five other Africans of their clothes and dignity, and forced them to pose for photographs against their will. A photographer, Joseph T. Zeely, then captured them from the front, side, and back, like the specimens Agassiz considered them to be. Now, 173 years later, Harvard's Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology holds within its vast collection the resulting 15 images, a kind of early photograph called daguerreotypes. They are the oldest known photographs of enslaved persons in America. They had been discovered precisely in the year 1976 by Ellie Reichlin, a former staff member. Reichlin spent months doing research to try to identify the people in the photos, but Harvard University did not make efforts to contact the families. Instead, had licensed the photos for use and profit. Renty was dragged into the studio and uh, they took the only thing that hadn't been taken yet from Renty. And that was his image because he could not own property. And, and since 1850, Harvard has had some role in that. And they continue to keep the image and use it to, for profit and prestige. In 2011, Tamara Lanier, a descendant of Renty, wrote a letter to the president of Harvard that identified herself as a direct descendant of the Taylors and asked the university to turn over the photos of Renty Taylor and his daughter Delia to her. But she was utterly ignored. Today we will unveil a plaque that will document the presence of four enslaved individuals in the households of two Harvard presidents who lived in Wadsworth House. The plaque is intended to remember them and honor them, and to remind us that slavery was not an abstraction, but a cruelty inflicted on particular humans. The past never dies or disappears. It continues to shape us in ways we should not try to erase or ignore. We must never forget. So that's past Harvard University President Drew Faust speaking at the unveiling of this plaque. Tamara Lanier, as you hear her speak, your thoughts. Well, interestingly enough, I received notice of that meeting from someone on social media, and I wrote to her and asked if I could attend that event, and I was denied, um, or I was told no. Um, what, what resonates with me in that statement is when she talks about the past will never die, and it will continue to shape us in ways that we shouldn't ignore or forget. That's exactly what she did with Rinty and his legacy. At that time, she knew about Renty, she knew about me, she knew the stories that I've shared with everyone else, and I specifically asked her, 
Why is it that Harvard, the keeper of these images, is seemingly not interested when the entire world is amazed? But every time they had the opportunity to do the right thing by Renty, they chose not to. I wanted to ask you about that because this lawsuit comes after numerous attempts by you to contact different parts of Harvard University to try to get some response. Yes. Uh, could you talk about that, who you w reached out to and, oh and uh, what led you finally to say, I have to file a lawsuit? Virtually everyone. I sent emails. Um, I think ultimately Dr. Faust was the last person at Harvard I reached out to. Um, I wrote to history departments, history professors. Um, uh, again, as I explained in my email to Dr. Faust, I have sent emails almost to the point of ad nauseum and no response. In 2019, Tamara Lanier filed a lawsuit against Harvard University seeking the return of the daguerreotypes. The case drew national attention and raised questions about the ownership and control of images that depict the atrocities of slavery. The lawsuit was supported by 43 living descendants of Agassiz, who wrote in a letter of support for Harvard to give the daguerreotypes to Ms. Tamara Lanier and her family would begin to make amends for its use of the photos as exhibits for the white supremacist theory Agassiz espoused. What do you want to see happen to these photographs? Well, I, I certainly want to consider all of the options. Um, the one thing that um, I have talked about with my attorneys and with my family is it's important for me that people know who Rinty is and also who, or who Rinty was and who Agassiz was. And I hope that there's a greater um, education or reteaching of history so that we can dispute the legacy that Agassiz has kind of stained my family with. In 2021, a federal judge ruled in favor of Harvard, stating that the university had a right to keep the daguerreotypes for educational and research purposes, including the common law principle that the subject of a photograph holds no property rights in the photo. However, the case has continued to raise important questions about the ethical treatment of historical artifacts and the legacy of slavery. Gordon, The Scourged Back, 1863. Prepare to be moved by the mind. Troubling image of the scourged back, a stark reminder of the physical and emotional pain inflicted upon enslaved people of color. The scars on Gordon's back, etched by a cruel whip, serve as a poignant testament to the brutality of slavery. The jagged lines on his back, each of them signifying intense dehumanization, objectification and debasement. Gordon was an enslaved African-American who became an iconic figure during the Civil War in exposing the brutality of Ahimafa, that is, Atlantic slavery. This famous photograph of Gordon, titled The Scourged Back. This famous photograph of Gordon, titled The Scourged Back, was widely circulated by abolitionists and, in July 1863, Three engraved portraits of him were printed in Harper's Weekly, the most widely read journal during the Civil War. Gordon had received a severe whipping from his enslaver, which left him with horrible welts on much of the surface of his back. He was so severely whipped that he fell into a coma and was bedridden for months. Recuperating in bed, Gordon decided to escape. In March 1863, he fled his home, heading east towards the Mississippi River. In order to mask his scent from the bloodhounds chasing him, Gordon took onions from the plantation, which he carried in his pockets. After crossing each creek or swamp, he rubbed his body with these onions in order to throw the dogs off his scent. He fled over 80 miles over the course of 10 days before reaching Union soldiers who were stationed in Baton Rouge. While at this encampment, Gordon decided to enlist in the Union Army. He underwent a medical examination on April the 2nd 1863. It was during this examination that military doctors discovered the severe keloid scars from several whippings. Two photographers, William D. McPherson and his partner, Mr. Oliver, were in the camp at the time, and Gordon was asked to pose for a picture that would reveal the harsh treatment he had recently received. McPherson and Oliver then mass-produced and sold copies of Gordon's portrait in the small and popular format of the time, known as the Carte de Visite. On the verso of the mount were the comments of S.K. Towley, Surgeon, 30th Regiment, Massachusetts Volunteers. Few sensational writers ever depicted worse punishments than this man must have received. 
though nothing in his appearance indicates any unusual viciousness. But on the contrary, he seems intelligent and well-behaved. The photographs of Gordon were used by abolitionists throughout the United States as visual evidence of the brutality of the Maffa. The image provoked an immediate response, as copies circulated quickly and widely. An unidentified writer for the New York Independent wrote, This card photograph should be multiplied by 100,000 and scattered over the states. It tells the story in a way that even Mrs. Harriet Beecher Stowe, author of the 1852 book Uncle Tom's Cabin, cannot approach because it tells the story to the eye. On July 4, 1863, Harper's Weekly reproduced the image as a wood engraving with the article, A Typical Negro. Two other portraits of Gordon, one, as he entered our lines, and the other, in his uniform as a U.S. soldier, were also included. Together, these three images and the accompanying article about his harrowing journey and the brutality of Southern slaveholders transformed Gordon into a symbol of the courage and patriotism of African Americans. Gordon soon afterward enlisted in an African American regiment. His example also inspired many free blacks in the North to enlist. He was said to have fought bravely as a sergeant in the Corps d'Afrique during the siege of Port Hudson, an important Confederate stronghold on the Mississippi River, 20 miles north of Baton Rouge. This battle, on the 27th of May, 1863, marked the first time that African-American soldiers played a leading role in an assault on a major Confederate position. Their heroism was widely noted and helped convince many skeptics to accept the enlistment of African-Americans into the U.S. Army. There are no further records indicating what became of Gordon. Yet, this famous image of him lives on as a searing testament of slavery's brutality and the fortitude displayed by so many African-Americans during this period. Slaves Picking Cotton this photo shows enslaved people picking cotton on a plantation in the American South. The slaves are hunched over, working in the hot sun. They are wearing ragged clothes, and their feet are bare. This photo is a reminder of the hard labor that enslaved people were forced to perform in those dark days. Slave Auctions in Virginia, 1853 This photo shows a slave auction in Richmond, Virginia. The slaves are lined up on a block like animals, being inspected by potential buyers. This engraving shows a man and woman, with a child in her arms, on an auction block, surrounded by white men. G. H. Andrews explained how the auction rooms for the sale of Negroes are situated in the main streets and are generally the ground floors of the building. The entrance door opens straight into the street and the sale room is similar to any other auction room. Placards, advertisements, and notices as to the business carried on are dispensed with the only indications of the trade being a small red flag hanging from the front doorpost and a piece of paper upon which is written. This simple announcement, Negroes for sale at auction. George Henry Andrews, from 1816 to 1898, was a British engineer, marine painter, watercolorist, and illustrator. In 1860, he was sent to North America to cover the Prince of Wales's tour of Canada and the U.S., he made his sketches on the spot. This photo is a stark reminder of the dehumanizing nature of slavery. The Africans of the Slave Bark, Wildfire, 1862. This widely reproduced engraving shows the emaciated survivors of the Middle Passage on the top deck of the American slave ship known as Wildfire, owned by New Yorkers. Captured in April, 1860 by the U.S. Navy, within sight of Cuba, its presumed destination the wildfire had violated the U.S. law, enacted in 1808, prohibiting the importation of slaves from overseas. Taken on board at the Congo River at the Luango Coast and Kwanzaa North regions, the 510 captive Africans who had survived the Atlantic crossing, as 90 had perished during the voyage, were taken to Key West, Florida. A correspondent for Harper's Weekly boarded the ship soon after it anchored and wrote a very vivid and lengthy account of the captives and their physical condition. His description started with the observation that all of the Africans he saw on the deck were in a state of entire nudity, in a sitting or squatting posture. They sat very close together, mostly on either side. About 50 of them were full-grown young men, and about 400 were boys aged from 10 to 16 years. 
When he descended into the deck below, he saw 60 or 70 women and young girls, in nature's dress, some sitting on the floor and others on the lockers, and some sick ones lying in the berths. Four or five of them were, a good deal, tattooed on the back and arms, and three had an arm branded with the figure seven, which we suppose is the merchant's mark. During the Atlantic slave trade, most captive Africans were transported across the Atlantic in a state of complete nudity. This photo is a reminder of the horrors of the Middle Passage. Slave Revolt, 1839 Today's political and social turmoil, sparked by racially motivated injustice seen in many parts of the world, has deep historical roots. This photo is a stark reminder of the resistance of enslaved people. Presented as a mere glimpse into a much larger story, this chapter highlights the remarkable contribution of black political actors to the Haitian Revolution of 1791 to 1804, the ultimately successful insurrection for the cause of liberty against enslavement and brutal oppression by European colonial powers. A Slave Woman with Her Children, 1863 This photograph of a slave woman with her children was taken by Timothy O'Sullivan during the Civil War. The woman is unidentified, but her face is filled with love and protectiveness. The photograph is a tender reminder of the unbreakable bond between mother and child, regardless, slave family. This photo shows a slave family in Alabama. The parents are seated on a bench, with their children standing around them. The parents look tired and worn down, while the children look frightened. Loud as the photo speaks in its depiction, we see that although most enslaved men and women formed families, these families were always vulnerable. Parents and children could be the property of different owners. Separation was always a threat, as family members could be sold or sent away according to the needs and wishes of the slaveholder. The extent to which enslaved families existed at the sufferance of owners is untellable. That the members of a slave family were owned by others gave people outside the family the absolute right to intrude upon the family's private world and profoundly disrupt it at will. This photo is a reminder of the toll that slavery took on families in those dark days. After the sale, slaves going south from Richmond. An 1854 oil painting by English artist Air Crow depicts newly purchased slaves being loaded onto a railroad car at the Richmond and Petersburg Railroad Depot on 8th Street in Richmond. Crow accompanied British novelist William Makepeace Thackeray on a 1853 speaking tour in the United States traveling throughout the East Coast and the South. While visiting Richmond, the artist attended a slave auction and afterwards noted, we saw the usual exodus of Negro slaves marched under escort of their new owners across the town to the railway station where they took places and went south. Written on the side of the railroad car are the words Warrington Ridgeway, which indicate that the slaves are being moved south toward Ridgeway, North Carolina. From North Carolina, some or all of the slaves might have been sent farther south, part of the large-scale movement of slaves from the Upper South to the Lower South. At center, an enslaved woman in a cart hands her baby to a black man. At bottom right, two well-dressed men involved in the slave trade, one of whom holds a rolled-up whip in his right hand, talk business. The railway scene takes place within sight of the columned Virginia State Capitol, which is visible in the distance above the railroad car. This oil painting, titled After the Sale, Slaves Going South from Richmond, was first exhibited in London at the 1854 Society of British Artists, under the title Going South, a sketch from life in America. Slaves in a coffle. This sad image reveals the grisly experience of slavery, where captives are put in a coffle and marched to the coast for shipment. It is a terrible experience and sad reminder of the atrocities committed during this dark age of slavery. The coffle is an instrument which couples them together by the neck, as in the accompanying engraving. And in this harassing position, they are marched, under many other privations and cruelties to the sea, where they are put on board a slave ship. In some cases, as many as a hundred captives are linked together in this coffle, while they're flogged along as they are marched to their new destination. Gaze into the eyes of a young slave boy, a portrait that captures the sadness and resignation etched upon his youthful face. His innocence, juxtaposed with the harshness of his surroundings, highlights the devastating impact of slavery on children. 
Witness the unbreakable bond of family in A Slave Family, a photograph that stands as a symbol of strength and perseverance. Despite the hardships they faced, these families remained united, their love and determination providing them with the strength to endure. Feel the weight of history in a slave market, an image that exposes the dehumanizing practice of selling human beings as property. The faces of the enslaved, filled with fear and uncertainty, reflect the injustice and despair that characterized this era. This photograph of an old slave woman was taken by Timothy O'Sullivan during the Civil War. The woman is unidentified, but her face is etched with pain and weariness. The photograph is a powerful reminder of the suffering endured by slaves. This brings us to the end of this video segment. We hope you have had an interesting viewing. Do you have a thing or two to share? Go ahead and tell us what you think in the comment section below. We are always delighted to hear your thoughts and learn from them. Also, kindly remember to support us by pressing the like button in your front, share with family and friends to keep spreading our eye-opening black narrative, and subscribe to keep the channel growing. Thank you for watching.